Howdy doody. Oh, your microphone didn't sound great then. Hi. It doesn't? I think it sounds oh, you're good. okay now. You can howdy doody me again. Howdy doody. I don't know how to reply to a howdy doody. Do you like that? I, I like those little phrases that sound so silly. I love when people do that. Like, like howdy doody. Like howdy doody. Just love it. I don't know what it is. So disarming. Mm, but there's something that I don't like when people say. <laughs> oh, I see where you're going there. I didn't mean to. But, I mean, why don't we just, why don't we just jump on right in? Unless you want to check in. Is there anything you want to, you want to relax into this? Anything you want to share with the listeners about how you're feeling today? I bought these white flesh nectarines from Marks and Spencer's. Was three pound fifty for four, which I feel like American grocery prices. Mine, but they're yeah. going to say each. No, <laughs> I feel like that is a lot for four nectarines, three pounds fifty. But I had one last night, and it was just—I'm going to cry. It was so good. And then today, <laughs> I was just so about having one, and they're only really good in the summer. And I'm enjoying cold food because you know I've got a thing about hot food, and I realize yeah. that's only really when it's cooler. Look at you just appreciating life. <laughs> that must be so annoying for anybody who's not not <laughs> feeling that. <laughs> well, maybe it's just hopeful. Maybe. You too can one day enjoy the white flesh of a nectarine. I can't wait to have one after this recording. Well, now you made me want one. It is, yeah, I hear you. I'm loving. I love when it's this time of year. Although I will say that I have a fair number of clients who feel like the sun is a bully, as Glennon Doyle says, like don't want to wear less clothing and don't want to confront the pressure and expectation to be outside. And that could yeah. be an issue. Maybe we can yeah. make an episode about that one day. It's not what we're talking about today, though. Today, we're talking about when how to handle commentary. Um, mm. not necessarily, I don't think about us per se, although it can certainly include that, but just sort of diet culture infused language and diet culture infused value systems because yeah. they're pretty prevalent. And it made me think about yesterday. Um, I was on the call with my mom. Okay. I'm going to give a warning to people because my mom's comment is a little triggering and gracious. Uh, she said to me, we're on the phone. We're just talking about this, talking about that. We talked about my daughter who just went to her first bat mitzvah over the weekend. And I had taken some pictures of her and they went to my parents had seen the pictures. And I had said something to my mom about, you know, how, how it went and it was in. And she said, oh, yeah, I saw a jewelry. She looked really nice. Um, I saw her dress. I said, yeah, I was like, it's uh, interesting. Like the, the dress that, dresses that I used to wear to bat mitzvahs are so different. They look so different now. They're more of this like bodycon type dress that, that kids are wearing, like very tight fitting dresses. And my mom says, well, you don't have to worry about her wearing stuff like that. Have you seen some of these other people wearing things like that? That shouldn't be. They should. They, what do they think they're getting away with? I heard my mom say this and I almost fell off my couch because I was like, and I said to her right then, I mean, I couldn't help myself. And I said, mom, I like shouted at her. I interrupted her and I said, first of all, do you know who you're talking to? No, it's not what I'm saying. I said, stop judging. And she said, judging. And I said, you 100% are judging. She said, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. I mean, I could not. I get very defensive about this mm -hmm. and I have no qualms about being defensive. Um, but it was just, it was, it was maddening because, number one, because it is. And I heard my grandmother in that. And a part of me was like, this is my mother's generation and her mom. Like, it reminded me very much of that generational way of thinking so there's a part of me that's like i know that that's just how my mom has been brought up and how she talks and she's now 70 years old like that's not likely to change but the fact that she said it to me with such like so without even thinking about it and even when i called her out and she still was defending it made me so mad because it's like this is my life's work like how how could you not understand like the way that that lands for me and it made me so mad and my response is fight or flight. I mean, I am fight. So I did. And I mean, I, I didn't. Yeah, I, I wasn't rude to her. I just was very, very, very firm. And I couldn't help it. And that's my that's how I deal with it. And that's how I'm glad I deal with it, actually. Um, But I'm also aware that in another part of the nervous system, that kind of a comment would shut somebody down and maybe make somebody go into a flight or a freeze kind of place where 
we don't respond. And then that can sometimes feel really like the second part, like the second arrow, um, because it's like, I, why didn't I say something? Why do I you know, freeze in, in moments like that? I don't even know what to say in moments like that. Um, and I feel like I almost feel a little of, of my fight privilege there because I, I do really easily know how to shut that down and say, I'm, that's not OK with me. So can I ask then, if she had made exactly the same comment six years ago, so mm -hmm. pre your recovery, would mm -hmm. you have had the same reaction, similar reaction, different reaction? I would have had a similar reaction because the sentiment, so the sentiment of it is is everything that always felt really ugly to me. And I already had, an like, that was something I was always defensive against. But I don't know that I would have had the confidence to defend it so much. And I also don't think I would have had the insult to like, this is what I've been doing for the past five years. Like, this is what I talk about. You've been on my podcast. Like, <laughs> you know, well, I've done it. You know? How do you not hear it? How, how do you not, you know? So there's that part, which was secondary, which was, whereas before I would have been like, well, of course she's saying that to me. I've been cons conspiring right along with that all this time. Um, so there's a part of it that felt like just such a miss as far as like, do, do you know me? And then there was another part of it that felt just mad that like also like have you learned nothing <laughs> like what i've said like uh, and honestly that she was trying to defend it even when i pointed it out which is very mo of my family there's a lot of defense in my clearly i didn't well while you were being defensive but the difference being you were right <laughs> that's right we all, we all think we're right and no, she just couldn't. And even she couldn't give it to me at the end. I kept saying, like, no, that is 100 percent. That is judgmental. That's exactly what that is. And I said, I said, I said, let people wear what they want to want to wear. Stop being the voice of oppression. I mean, but my family's always like, oh, here she goes. But I don't care. I, I just feel like, however, if someone had said that to me who wasn't my mother, I wouldn't have reacted like that. I, I wouldn't have. I think my, my, I would have had more difficulty with that response because I find it more difficult to stay in the place of the middle where, you know, I'm speaking to somebody who, you know, I don't have the liberty of being able to say, hey, 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 you know what I mean? Like my family and I, we, this is how we talk to each other. You know, that's very open, but not to a stranger or an acquaintance or even like a, you know, a friend even. Um, that, that's where that would be harder for me to be like, how do I address this in a way that's respectful and where I'm not like, so staunch, you know, not that that's bad, but, you know, how do I not let my fight response go and do this in a moderate way? And this is regulation for me. Um, how do you, you know, and of course, I, I also think it's worth talking about the ways that we talk to people and comment, like who that person is matters as far as like what kind of comments or responses are going to feel more appropriate inside of us. You know, how would you respond if somebody said that? Well, I was just thinking that actually when you were talking. I was thinking, obviously, it's going to depend on the person. So I was imagining if I just met somebody, I wouldn't say anything. If it was a friend, well, this is how I imagine, like, I would go something like, I don't know, I think people should just wear whatever they want. Yeah. And I often do that. I do that. Mm, don't know. But at this side, I'm like, I do know. I do know. And people should be allowed to wear what they want. And so yeah. it's slightly, it's deliberate. It's almost trying to be, oh, I'm just like having a, a moment of self-awareness. <laughs> that's what I do. I think that's a way of reining it in. I mean, I mean I'm going to use that. I'm going to try to, you know, kind of be like, hmm. I say, I guess because I'm so conscious, even in the moment, the minute anybody feels attacked, the defenses are going to go up and we just, we, we lock into a conflict. I'm trying to go in and just say something, owning it and really trying not to figure their defenses because I actually think it's the only way that I might, the only chance there is really of getting someone to even have a moment of going. And most of the time they probably won't. Anyway. Mm. That speaks to the, what's your goal? I think that might be a helpful thing to think about how do I, in the question, how do I respond to this kind of thing? Well, what is your goal? Because in your in what you just said, the goal is to almost maybe not bring up someone's defenses in the pursuit of opening their mind. Whereas my goal sometimes is just simply to not tolerate, right? To just like put a boundary up around that. 
And those two things might be conflicting because there are some people who are going to say stuff that I'm like, I'm not get, I'm not trying to open their mind. Their, their minds aren't going to get opened, but I'm not going to pretend it's OK. And that that sometimes is like, I don't care then if I cause a conflict or make them defensive. But I also think that there's ways of, you know, that that will conflict with people pleasing tendencies. And that's not going to feel possible for a lot of people. So, like, sometimes you know, look like sometimes I'll meet new people who will say stuff like that. And I I think I use body language to sort of reject it. Um, I certainly am not. I used to be the type of person who'd be like, <laughs> like a okay. nod and smile. Um, and now or like I'd laugh, you know, I'd be like, you know, and now I will just kind of either not. I'll leave my face still or I'll look away or I'll say like, mm, just to sort of inject a little bit of like, I'm not on board with that. I'm not going to talk about that, but I'm not on board with what you just said. I'm thinking now back to our conversation with Louise that we had on the podcast a few weeks ago. And when she was sharing the friend that said to her, basically called her out and said, all you do is talk about dieting and calories. And if you if you're saying this about your body, like, what does that mean about my body? Which I inferred from that, that the friend may have been in a bigger body than Louise. Yeah. And that, so that it was it was affecting the friend for Louise to be going on about this stuff all the time. Mm. And Louise's shock of being like, oh my goodness, I wasn't even thinking about you. I wasn't even thinking about you. And that really falls into how I think about it. Now, when anybody else talks about their body, who might be in a smaller body than me. But I do remember a few years ago, a friend of mine who has had a, a tricky relationship with, for her, it's always a tricky relationship with her weight, which how it's been spoken. I don't really understand her relationship with food even now. She doesn't talk about it like that. And so she's had, um, she's had a tummy tuck. She's had her, her breast implant and she uh, has all the aesthetic stuff now in her face. And when she was going, I think it was before the tummy tuck maybe, or a bit afterward, but she was going on and on about her body and how wrong her body was and this was too big and this was too big and I was there and I was looking at her and I was thinking you're smaller than I am like read the room read mm. the room and she just kept doing this and she kept doing this and I feel like I might have shared this on the podcast right near the very beginning I'm not sure and so I said to her I said when you're talking about your body like that and your body is smaller than mine it makes me wonder what you think of my body yeah and I think she had a similar reaction mm. to Louise she was like what? No, like, well, I just see you as someone who's really confident and you know, this, that and the other. And I remember at the time thinking, oh, I don't know about that. Yeah. But um, as in whether I believed that that was her reasoning or not, I don't know. But I think it, it's interesting because I think part of this trigger that happens is when someone is talking about dieting or whatever, it happens so fast. It's not even processed consciously, but it's like, Oh, this is this is about me. Like we make it about us in some way. Like it felt like with your mum, she missed you. You're like, Mum, this is what I talk about all the time. Like I cannot even believe you would come out with this to me because mm -hmm. it feels that reaction feels like that. And I think this is probably what people are dealing with out there. I think would it be fair to say when people are talking about dieting, diet culture, body size? Sometimes, but sometimes no. Equally, I felt like I don't like that value system. And even if somebody had said that without knowing what I do, or like, again, if somebody says something and it's not about you, you're not necessarily feeling like it's because they know your struggle. It's still this idea. Like I have a group of friends and one of my friends is in a larger body. And sometimes the conversation goes to, you know, body dissatisfaction among the smaller people in the group. And I'm always like, I'm always very aware of like reading this reading the room thing where it's like just from that perspective, like just from a just from an awareness perspective of how judgmental, first of all, it sounds, period, just the, the principle of it, you know, not just about me, but just about like the idea of do you have an awareness about the way you're speaking? And I self-awareness is a thing for me. Like I have a lot of like, oh, I get really frustrated when with without that. And I and I also feel like as you're talking, I'm like, I come at life, and some of us might resonate with this, from the point of view that the other is against us. Like I come at life from a fight, like as if my duke's gotta be up. But when you're talking about even Louise and this lack of awareness around that, that's not the same. So it's it's interesting if we kind of can know in ourselves are we defensive? 
You know what I mean? Is is everything we're reading defensive or can we open up? Cause I have to remind myself sometimes I'm like that person is not speaking to attack, whether me or anyone else. They're speaking potentially just from ignorance or like they're not thinking about it because I do think the way people speak about their own bodies is often a lot of projection of our own stuff. And there's something about we need culturally more of that insight that like when we talk about fatness as the funnel through which all bad things are represented, that that's inherently oppressive. And I don't like not defending that. And I don't and I do feel a little bit anti. I do feel a little bit like a tacky about that. So even where somebody is is not coming from a place of attack, I still feel a, a defensiveness around that, that that might be helpful for me to soften around like as far and maybe not. But but there's a part of me that like understands that there's something in my own self that I need to look at as far as why do I feel like everyone's always on the attack instead of looking at it like maybe there's a teaching moment here potentially or there's just like a no, I don't like that's not something I subscribe to without getting so angry about it. You know what I mean? And I think that's something I need to work on. At other times, I feel like that anger is really appropriate and I'm glad I have it, you know, because it's an advocacy voice as well. Um, but it's sometimes a toggle between what's ours and what's theirs. And in my mind, what's coming up and the compassion piece for where somebody is. Because when somebody is in that body image distress, let's say they're, they're even in a small body and they are so distressed by their body, how they perceive their body, how they experience their body. And you and I would say it's not about the body, but their whole experience is that it is. Like that, that piece, that connection that it could mean anything else apart from that their body is wrong, isn't there. And when you're outside of it, like when we're outside of it and we're looking at people in this situation, we're getting a very different viewpoint than the person that's in it and can't see it yet. I think there's something for me that, that to soften that kind of... Um, whether it's frustration or whatever mm -hmm. that feeling can be with somebody sometimes in the way that they might speak about their body is remembering that piece about where they are. And actually, when I hear somebody in a smaller body, like a lot of body dissatisfaction or something like that, for me, let's say this is not in a therapy session. This is just yeah. out and about in the world. For me, I find that really reassuring. It really genuine. And I know like, I should be mad at me. I should be mad about like the value system because I don't agree in the value system, but it's reassuring because I'm like, oh yeah, it's not about our body. And it kind mm. of reaffirms no, my I stance see. That, I see. that people in all sides of bodies can feel that body dissatisfaction, that body distress, that our bodies are wrong in some way. They're not comfortable. They don't look like they should. They don't act like they should. They don't feel mm. like they should. That that is a universal experience. For me, it's like a leveler. I understand that. I can't be okay with just that. I need, I feel like I need to point out to people, no, that's actually what you're doing is projecting. And you're projecting onto actually a whole group of people, really. I know you're talking about yourself and I know you're not yeah. judging other people, but it is. And I, I just am not comfortable with not saying something there. So, because when you like want to point out, like, and I know you, you know this as well, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to um, suggest that you don't already know this. But we can't point it out. People have to realize it. No. So, no, no. I'm gonna, I'm gonna but say that's it. How self awareness happens? We don't become self aware because someone tells us something about ourselves. Totally. I don't think they're gonna get it. But I, but it's about, it's about, it's about a boundary to me. It's about saying like I, whether I'm putting this up and I'm naming this because it matters to me. And you might keep crossing it, but I'm gonna keep putting it up. That that feels way more safe to me than not putting it up. Because I don't, I, I, can't, I feel very uncomfortable with that. And, and I don't, I just can't. I can't even like, I can't even think beyond it. I don't even know. That's all I can see. But wait. Like, <laughs> like, you had like a little going sigh on. then. There was a little somatic kind of collapse that just happened in that moment. It's like, we need to change gears because yeah. like we're driving. Yeah, I don't want to, I want to, I want to move away from my activation. Yeah. Um, yeah. And into something more helpful. Yeah. Well, that could be helpful for some people. But let's also look at, I, I also received a text from somebody who said, who gave the, the following scenario. She said, you know, could you post or can you give me some thoughts on how I might 
deal with with a comment out there that has nothing to do with um it's not about this angle right and it's also not from like a family member and the scenario was this person travels frequently and she travels to I believe africa she was traveling to africa i think that's where it was and she goes there i guess once a year and she had gone through recovery and she had gained weight and she had been there and somebody said to her, oh, it looks like you're pregnant, first of all. And the second one was, I have to find it, just a second. She said, I've had people congratulate me on my pregnancy, saying, wow, you get bigger every time I see you. In, in Africa, it's more of a compliment. Uh, as a spring break guide said, I thought you were a bodybuilder, not a psychologist. How do we deal with comments like that? Because... It's not as attacking. Like, it's not this this kind of thing where you'd be like, hey, don't speak about it. it. It's more like you're commenting on my body in a way that I'm not, I don't feel comfortable with, even though you're not criticizing it. You know what I mean? At least not outwardly. And I think that the message that she sent was indicating that it wasn't meant to be a criticism. It was actually just meant to be body observation. And how do we deal with people observing and commenting on our bodies? Like, what is that bringing up? It's more just like I feel vulnerable in having in somebody feeling like they can just come up to me and tell me what they what they're seeing mm -hmm. and that I didn't invite them to do that. And that feels a way, you know, practically, first of all, and then kind of delving further under that. It depends whether this is somebody who is doing this regularly. So if this is just a one off comment here and there that you're not likely to get again from the same person, it might be extremely vulnerable to say anything because to say something, you have to disclose how you feel about something and you're disclosing how you feel about your body in that, which could be the most vulnerable thing. So I had a friend where a taxi driver thought she was pregnant. What do you do with that? It wasn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't meant as any kind of insult. I mean, it's the stupidest thing ever, I think, for anybody to assume that anyone is pregnant ever. So she didn't say anything except talk about it repeatedly for the next few weeks with her friends whenever it came up. But if this is somebody in your life that makes comments and it, you feel uncomfortable, that's the time when there's a conversation about putting a boundary in. Yeah. But in order to put a boundary in, you need to disclose that you feel uncomfortable with that person's comment. So are you okay with that person knowing that you feel uncomfortable about that comment? Because that's ultimately the question here. Because yeah. you might not want somebody to know how you feel about what they say. In which case, if that is the more important thing here, the safer thing is for them not to know, you, you're not going to be able to draw an explicit boundary. You're going to have to navigate your reaction to those comments. Yeah. Well, there could also be just a sincere, like, oh, I don't want to cause a conflict. I don't want to name what I, like, cause, because there is some kind of confrontation in it. That's like, it's not like I don't want someone to know how I feel. I'd just rather I didn't have to say it out loud because that feels confronting and I'm, I have difficulty with that. But there's also something in this about, I'm trying to compare it to if somebody in that situ those situations I described said, you dyed your hair. It's brown. Oh, last time your hair was darker. Would I be asking this question? Like how to handle that? It's still an observation of myself and my body or part, you know, but it wouldn't strike me. I'd be like, yeah, I dyed it. You know what I mean? Be like, yep, it's different. And the fact that we're saying that this, that it's a weight based observation is in and of itself the trigger. There's something about our own potential discomfort with our weight, which is, I guess, goes, can go without saying, but it, it is also kind of like, is that our work to do? You know, about, about, I guess at one time I would have been like, that's our work to do. We have to dismantle the fat phobia. And I've recently more come to this place of like, I think we have a certain amount of fat phobia that sometimes doesn't get dismantled. Like there will always exist some inside of us. So it's not very helpful all the time to say that's yours. Work on it. You know what I mean? To me, it's almost like there are times where it's like, I don't need to look. For example, so many people are triggered by photographs of themselves, right? If we went around and be like, you're going to have your photograph taken 10 times a day and someone's going to show it to you 10 times a day, you'd probably get like triggered by that because there's just a certain amount of your own reflection that you want to be confronted with every day. And I don't know, like, is that fat phobic or is it just, is it something more? Is it like this evasive, like, I don't need you to be pointing out to me when I'm not looking for that or I'm not, I'm trying to be in my body and live. I don't need to be reminded of my objective self. 
even if I don't know, is it always is it always like sort of a fat phobic thing? If if your body looks a certain way and you see your reflection 10 times a day, is that fine? You know what I mean? Or is there always like this idea of confrontation when you see yourself anyway? I don't know. I don't know if it's like more existential than just that. Well, obviously, it depends as well what it is that if you're seeing pictures of yourself and you're saying my body is too big, if it's a size thing and appearance because of size thing, then, yeah, I guess that would come under the branch of the kind of the fat phobia that's so embedded in so many of us. Not like it can just be completely weeded out. We learn to recognize it and keep trying to manage our responses to that. That's the work. But it's still going to be there, right? It's still going to be there. So I think there's a, there's an element of that. But I, I really do think that also having somebody comment on the way you look without your predicting they're going to do that, there's something about that that for reasons I haven't quite articulated feels a way. It, it feels because if someone tells me the hair comment once, it's like, fine, because there's no fat phobia in that. So maybe I can get over it that faster. But if someone kept doing that or different people kept doing that, I would kind of be like, I think that there's a part of me that would be like, uh, uh, it's taking me out of myself. It's ta- it's reminding me of my objectivity in a way that takes me out of the moment of being there. I don't know. There's something about excessive commentary on how one looks that feels like almost like, do you see me though? You know what I mean? I don't know. There's there's something more to it for me. I've got another friend as well who I think she's got better at it because she hasn't been doing it recently, but uh, she used to do it a lot, like always comment on my appearance always trying to find something favorable but every time we met she would have to say something about my appearance complimenting something I was wearing complimenting my hair and I find that so strange because I never I never say anything about anyone's appearance yeah probably to detriment you know like how you said one of your kids was saying like mom I just want you to say that Mm -hmm. sometimes like I look pretty when I Mm -hmm. you know got ready for something and I think I'm just I don't really think about other people's appearance a lot and so it often takes me by surprise when other people are thinking about mine. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I think it's an uncomfortable thing. Did I tell you about the comment I had on YouTube the other week? About your I teeth? Told, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. someone said to me. So uh, yeah, how do you someone, respond to that? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, someone, someone wrote on YouTube. It was like a really complimentary one. To be, you're, you're, you're so smart and you're beautiful and you're this, that and the other, but you really need to see a good orthodontist. And I was, I think that one was, yeah. Did we talk about it on the podcast? No. Just, okay. That one, I don't know why, but that one really kind of like, it, it prodded and it poked at me because what it did is it made me think, oh my goodness, if one person has put that on a YouTube video, are there a thousand more people who think that and just haven't said it? Mm. That was for me something like, am I so unaware that I have something about my appearance that's so distracting that someone's saying, in spite of that I'm all these things, I need to go and see a good orthodontist. Yeah. That goes back to that thing we've talked about before about this this idea, this discomfort around people knowing things that we don't or people seeing things that we didn't see, being ignorant to that. I, I'd be curious, number one, to hear how you responded. And I'm also thinking about how I would have responded which does actually speak to that concept of how I confront that kind of a concept because mm-hmm. I'm uncomfortable with that same thing. Tell me first and then I'll, and I'll tell you exactly what I wrote. I think that if it were me, I, I would say I'm perfectly aware of my teeth and I'm okay with them um, because that would be true because I, because I generally have body neutrality. You know what I mean? And, like I, I would, and also to say like I'm aware, like that, that whole I'm aware thing mm-hmm. diffuses for me what's so uncomfortable about somebody saying that so I think I would respond that way yeah I wrote what a strange comment to write yeah why do you say this and just That's ask the question better. I'm like explain yourself say more like wh- where mm. is this coming from and because I think confusion I th- and we might have spoken about this I think on the podcast before but that's my favorite one with something if someone were to say something that I don't know let's say someone comments even on weight gain to just go, that's a really strange thing yes. to say to somebody. Why yes. would you? And, and asking it a question. I, yeah. I, I love that response. I, I think, think that's a great go-to. I yeah. think if you take anything from this episode, listeners, take that one with you. I, I read somewhere too, um, the, it wasn't what a strange, it was a, what an interesting thing to say. 
And I've used that in scenarios that have nothing to do with this, actually, where somebody was saying things that constantly like just made me feel uncomfortable. And so I forget if it was Mike who told me to say it or if I read it and it was what and to just come back with, well, that's an, that's a funny thing to say. That's, that's, a, that's a funny thing to say because it just puts the onus right back. And you don't, and it takes nothing out of your own integrity, or doesn't, and doesn't show any of your cards either. So I think that in, when, if in doubt, potentially use that one. It's including yeah. to these ones that I read out that might apply. I quite like interesting as well. There's something I think really veiled about that, especially coming from a therapist. Just go, oh, that's an interesting. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's a no. I just figured out your whole history from that one comment you made. <laughs> well, I see you. That's great, but. So I guess the person in my life that I hear it the most from is my dad. I hear, I've gained a couple of pounds, I've lost a couple of pounds, I've gained a couple of pounds. I used to find it so, I, my whole body used to tense up when he did this because I used to just feel so angry. And I, not because I ever felt personal. I think where it was for me, I saw him struggling with this whole, for him, he wants to lose weight and he would say it's for his health and I would actually agree that that's his motive i don't think it's a, an appearance based mm. thing particularly mm-hmm. at all i think it is because he believes it would improve its health and the reason why i used to find it this was a real turning point as triggering as i did was because i often see myself in my dad he can be an uncomfortable mirror at times yeah what i saw was him struggling with weight loss for decades and not being able to ever do it and I was also frustrated at myself at the same thing because I was wanting to lose weight at this time. And so for me, hearing him struggle with it was like a mirror to my own struggle. And so I didn't want to hear it. I didn't want to hear it. I didn't want to think that I could be at his point in life and still basically feeling and acting the same around food as I was at that time. When I made more peace with not pursuing weight loss and being okay with that and kind of just accepting that this is where I am, it just, it, yeah, it, it stopped it triggering you. It shifted because, mm. and and this is the piece I guess about the inner work, and it's up, it's up to a point because I agree with what you're kind of inferring this idea of sometimes almost taking over responsibility that somehow well it's just for us to manage, and it is just for us to manage, and ultimately we're the only ones that experience our feelings. If we reverse back ten years, I couldn't have just made myself feel okay about it I couldn't have just stopped myself feeling the way I felt it took a long time to get to that point so I would like to have been a bit kinder to myself I guess through that process in hindsight and that's what I would want for people who are in it now Mm -hmm. to just think oh you should be able to undo this stuff in a couple of weeks and then you'll no and no longer be triggered it it takes yeah and it's also like knowing what you're saying the two things are true like there's times where especially when we're baby fawns in this game and and or we're not worked through a lot of stuff that things are going to feel triggering and yes some of that is ours or it you know it's like i can own the part of this that's mine and i also want to say to someone like can you like or to set a boundary whether internal or you know like removing oneself or saying something out loud of like that's not helpful for me you know what i mean it's like a little bit of self-advocacy plus understanding yeah, and I'm working on that, but I'm not there. So could so I don't appreciate that. Or I don't want to talk about that. I'm I'm curious though about, you know, comments that come through that are meant to be personal, right? So not necessarily just the stuff that's like, oh, you're talking about that thing and it's triggering me because my stuff's not worked out on that, but more you're saying something to me and confronting me about my decisions or my body or my health and what you think about that, what your value systems are on that. How do we respond to that? I think we've talked about this in various places, but it's worth reiterating, Mm -hmm. maybe giving some people some scripts for different variations of response. Particularly, I'm concerned about your health. The concern about health is interesting because I've seen people, particularly in the anti-diet world, kind of go, they're not concerned about your health. There's that. We don't know someone's motive. I probably think a lot of the time when someone says they're concerned for someone's health because of their body size, that they probably are, but rightly Mm. or wrongly. Like that probably is a piece of it, that that can genuinely be the case. And so it's so hard when you're trying to undo this diet thing 
and go, I actually think that what I'm doing is healthier for me, but that person can't see it because that person only sees the pursuit of health in terms of weight loss. Because that's the conflict. Well, what you just said, though, to me is the response. It's, what did you say? I'm doing what I think is healthiest for me. Kind of like a let's agree to disagree. But I think that that phrase itself is helpful. I'm, I'm doing what I think is healthiest for me is a response. At that point, somebody may continue to push. Then, it's a, then it might become a boundary issue of like, I said what I said. You're not respecting my stance. I hear you. That's yours. And here's mine. But if you continue to push, then that's a different, almost like that becomes a different issue of somebody not with, not saying, okay, you got this. That's, it's your life. You know what I mean? Or we'll, we'll just agree to disagree on that. Or what do you, t- you know, oh, there's also the option of I'm exploring health through mental health. I'm exploring health through other factors besides weight, you know, and, and I think that can be hard. But I think like a bit of self-advocacy in a simple way, kind of like I, I hear you and I still maintain my position, period. Of course, we're oftentimes dealing with people who can't respect that. And again, then that's a different kind of self-advocacy for I need you to stop pushing your opinions on me or I need you to stop saying that to me. It's not helpful. All of this comes down to navigating conflict, ultimately. Mm. And like you said earlier, like the people-pleasing tendency, I think this is why some people find this so difficult. It's because it genuinely feels impossible to say to people, or especially to some people in your life, you think that and that's not what I think. And and I don't know that you've had that experience because I don't think it sounds like you're happily. Like, they'll disagree. Mm -hmm. But there are... It's not something that I would find easy to explicitly say to my dad, okay, you think this, but I'm going to think this. Hmm. There's something in my body because, the, you know, our parents are so wired into our conditioning that makes every part of me tense up at hmm. even the thought of saying that. Hmm. Oh, I say that to my dad a lot. The problem is that he's like, well, yeah, I respect that. Except let me tell you everything I think and convince you otherwise. Mm-hmm. Um but even the fact that he's at the beginning, like, yeah, I respect that. No, no, no. That, that w- wouldn't even be the case. Also want to mention that sometimes the discomfort comes from the fact that what the other person is saying, we do believe. So it's not just a case of you believe this, I believe this, have some respect. It's more like when you say that, you, you trigger my Tao. Yeah. Um, which is really hard because when we're saying, how do I handle that? We're not just saying, how do I respond? We're saying, how do I feel? Like, how do I help myself? feel regulated through that because if you're disrupting the it's like, okay i'm really trying really hard to believe that what i'm doing is is good for me or that it is that I'm not jeopardizing my health or that my weight is okay or body you know and then you say this thing and it completely triggers that vulnerability in me that's a that's i think really difficult that's the hardest part and for me how i've dealt with that well let me ask you how you how you do does that ever happen to you what happened sorry that that scenario of somebody saying something to you and it triggers your own doubt about it or your own vulnerability about it oh oh yeah yeah for sure i'm trying to think um i'm trying to think of an example an example might be particularly kind of in the earlier days of recovery trying to recover a hard to put time frame there are times where i found myself very defensive about the concept of food addiction I don't know if very defensive is even the right word, but I, I would feel like I'd have a, a response in here about it because there was doubt, because there is a sense of actually anything that is connected to the reward system, we could develop an addictive-like pattern to it. So I'm, I was trying to find my mind in this because I, I couldn't see how to reconcile the two. So I used to find... I don't know if this is the best example because I don't know that it was that strong a reaction. I'm sure there have been other examples where I felt more so. But now I can really hold steady with, yes, I think we can play out addictive patterns with food. But no, I don't think that looking at it and labeling it as a food addiction is helpful. Because it's more like, okay, this can happen. What are we doing about that? Because often food addiction or addiction models mean cutting foods out and abstinence, and that's going to trigger off restriction. So... I've landed really steady with that. So when people come at me with the whole food addiction argument, I'm like, yeah, I can can totally see where you're coming from. Mm. Like we're on the same page with some of these things here, but actually what's the conclusion and what's the outcome of it? Yeah. 
So that has shifted because mm. I used to feel more confused about it. And that would okay. have been the doubt piece that was being poked yeah. at because there's always a chance that anyone might take anything I say and then use it to choose a path that doesn't work for them. What I, what I got from that was where there is a trigger of your own doubt. The reason that that's uncomfortable is because I think at least I'm going to speak for myself. When I have been triggered by that, it's because my own clarity about the response about even let's I'll use the example of like health and weight because there was a time where I thought the two were related and if someone had said something you know in the beginning of recovery when somebody said something like that to me or if they had said my defenses would go up because I would have also had the doubt but that's because the, the clarity hadn't congealed yet so like there it was appealing to that very immediate part of me that just was uh, just was like yeah I'm afraid of that and it was it's kind of like being able to work through like you have to in order to feel sure in something and to feel really like solid i think it takes time and repetition of working that through in the new way like kind of like yeah that was how i felt but actually like this this and this follow now and that's the parts that follow now are the parts that are just starting to including even if all these things are true about weight and health and these things if I if I try to control my food, where does that actually leave me? That that consideration is like the second part of this that like I used to not have. And it's kind of like reminding myself to work through the logic and work through the the thought, finish the thought. And so that that starts to become more solid. And that takes time. And I think in the beginning, we don't have that solidity of that follow up thought, the follow up sort of arguments that are that have led us here in the first place. Those don't feel as strong. So we're just we're just saying with that initial doubt part without the answer, the responses to that, um, which is probably just more of a time and an intention thing, like a, more of a repetition of, no, this does feel really clear to me, actually. Like this, this, this does make sense to me. Yeah, it's interesting because as you were talking, I thought there is a sense of, I know you and I have spoken about this before, of reaching a place of going, I know from a grounded, embodied place that this is true for me in my experience and that feels steady now so if anybody pushes against that there might be annoyance that comes out that someone's trying to push against it but it's not a trigger in mm -hmm. the same way but there's another piece of it which perhaps is more when we're taking it broader so the danger is we go well, this is true for me now this is true for everybody kind of quite a human mm. thing that we do because we bump into conflict with people all the time when you work in an area like this and people have different ideas that the the trigger reduces as I've just become more comfortable with doubt. So there's an element of like, there's places for it to be grounded. And I call it grounded because I wouldn't even call it certain. I can just say, I feel this feels grounded and true. Yeah. But then there are other places where it's like, I can hold doubt and kind of go, yeah, that's possible. But that, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Like That's multiple truth to me. Like doubt feels different than multiple things being true because Doubt yeah. would suggest that groundedness is not reliable, whereas yeah, multiple yeah. truths would suggest it is reliable, and that might also be. Yeah. But I am okay with this one. Yeah. 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 Oh, I didn't think we were going to do it. I know. Do we, yeah. do we need to give people some take? feel like this is an episode that needs some takeaways, kind of like short, sharp. Well, I feel like there's a part of me that's like, yeah, everything we just said. That. <laughs> that was all the takeaway. I mean, like, I like the summary, but I'm like, yeah, but those, <laughs> whatever we just said, I can't remember, but those. Okay. Um, yeah, what did we say? Yeah. Yeah. I think there's there's something about being patient with yourself around still feeling triggered when you're doing this work and that that takes time for that sense of security and groundedness. So reaching out for support and finding places where you feel like that is helping to embed this value system that you're trying to adopt, which is no longer dieting or, or body size or shape. So that would be one piece. Another piece is the offering of confusion. If someone says something, makes a comment about your body that feels inappropriate. Mm. I mean, you're also very welcome to just go, I don't want you to say that to me about my body, or I don't feel comfortable with you commenting on my body like that. Yeah. I think a lot of people find that difficult to do, but I want totally. to offer it because it's an excellent one. If you feel, if you've got the, um, like that's in your personality and that feels okay or safe enough for you to do in a situation then do that. Otherwise, you can go with confusion. A or just a gesture. Again, I don't think we should feel guilty for not being that type of person. 
you know, or yeah. not being good enough at that. It's it's sometimes just non-participation, not laughing, you know, just holding in a neutral stance can be a response as well. Yes. It, it, it is our triggers are an opportunity for self-reflection and help to point to where the work is and needs to be done and all of that, blah, blah, blah. But don't um, make it and sort of almost an over individual thing. Mm. And like, again, the whole multiple truth thing. And it's also a chance to understand something about ourselves. So me understanding, and I think I did have glimpses of this self-awareness with my dad. The reason I was so mad at him when he would talk about what he was eating, what was going on with his weight, was because it brought up fear for me and my own experience. But that feeling was coming from that. And that became much clearer as I moved out of it. But I just want to offer it in case anybody else sees it in there for them. So mm. it's about being really, it's all come back to the same thing about being really kind to ourselves and also trying to be more aware of ourselves to understand what's going on for us. Yeah. I think it was a really nice conversation. Thanks for having it, Wilmy. Well, Thanks for all your questions and examples to the people who gave them to me to use as fodder for this conversation. All right. All right, then. Time to go. Time, Time to, go. to go. We will see you next week. Ta-ta. Ta-ta.